Okay. You know, I was very fortunate in one of the very first assignments I got was from National Geographic in 1980. And I shoot in the National Geographic style. Hey guys, we're back with Bob. This time, we're going to talk about lighting. Let's talk about your approach to and how you use light since photography means light writing. Knowing light, of course, is absolutely critical. I'm always looking at light. Always. Yeah, you know, looking at you now. Yeah. I'm seeing how the light hits this side of your face, soft light coming in from here, you know, light in your eyes. I'm, I'm always consciously looking at light, inevitably. I mean, it's what I do. Mm -hmm. I, I do it every day. And you have, to be, you have to be aware of light and what it does, and probably more importantly, how the camera reacts to that light. It's not just that you see what light does on a subject, it's knowing how your camera will record it. Yeah. Because I like dark areas in photographs. I like photographs that leave you asking questions. Not, I don't want photographs that give you all the answers, blah, it's mm -hmm. all, all in front of you. I like to keep dark areas with no information in them. And Kodachrome allowed that. Digital photography doesn't necessarily. You can change it so that it does, not. Right. I, I try and replicate that. but. I knew exactly how Kodachrome would react to light, and I know how my digital cameras will react to light, and exactly what I need to do to get the effect that I'm after. And you have to do that as a photographer. You have to practice and shoot things under different lighting conditions so that you know exactly what the end result is going to look like. There are two kinds of light. There's this shot where the light is completely within the frame. There is no external light source. It's often called Rembrandt lighting, although it's, Rembrandt didn't really paint that way all the time. There's a, a painter, from an 18th century painter from England that did. All his paintings had light emanating mm -hmm. from within the painting itself. And I take photographs like that occasionally where the light source is entire within the frame. Now at the other extreme, there's a lighting, type of lighting that I use extensively, which is often called Vermeer lighting which is light coming through a window like this, a north window light, which is very soft and very flattering. And this photograph taken of a tobacco farmer in Trinidad is using that kind of lighting. You, know, you go into a place like this, I was with this tobacco farmer for a fairly brief time, and um, I just wanted to get the shot and move on. Now, I want to spend some time, in, you, when you're shooting people, I hate the idea of just rushing in, taking a photograph and leaving. <clears throat> you have to spend time, you spend time getting to know the people and, re and getting some sort of relationship yeah. with them and then as brief a time as possible taking the photograph. As a travel photographer, I don't have the luxury of being able to carry a lot of equipment. I don't want to carry a lot of equipment. Right. Equipment gets in the way. It's always the biggest problem with photography, there's too much equipment. Yeah. It's not important. Um, so rather than light someone, I will move the person to the light. And with this tobacco farmer in Cuba, I moved him to an area in his barn where there was nice soft north light coming through to replicate this Vermeer look. Mm -hmm. Now I use that a lot. I love this kind of lighting, particularly against the dark background. It always looks great. And then you work with the person to get the right expression and the right energy from the person to make the photograph. But again, look at the eyes. Always make sure the eyes are well lit. So those are two extreme forms of light. And then there's light that bounces around. And I'll go to, um, I'll, I'll try and get people in the shade. Yeah, harsh sunlight rarely works. Yeah. So I, I try and get something in the shade, like this woman in a remote rural part of Cuba I loved her, the curlers in her hair, mm -hmm. but I wanted a soft light on her face. And then to, to give it nice even lighting, it's not really Vermeer lighting because it's coming from a broader surface, but it gives this nice soft bounce light that's bouncing around. Now if there's not quite enough light, sometimes I use even a sheet of newspaper, if you can find a newspaper these days, and try and bounce sun back into someone's face. You can always find something you can use to bounce light with. And newspapers work beautifully. Mm -hmm. Reflectors are not something that ref I use a lot, but occasionally you'll need them. And then, I, like, as you said, just seeing where the light source is and moving your subject so it's 
the kind of lighting that you want. One, one tip I can give for photographing people in sunlight, you know, a lot of photographers think that midday is the worst time of day to shoot. And it's certainly not ideal. I wouldn't choose to shoot at midday. But if you're a travel shooter, you have to shoot whenever, whenever there's light. Yeah. Even when there isn't light, you just shoot continually because it's expensive to travel and you don't have the luxury of waiting around. And this photograph of the same tobacco farmer in, uh, in Western Cuba, I shot during the day. I, it's probably around about midday. It was bright sunlight, as you can see from the light coming on the left-hand side of his face. So I moved him with his back to the camera. There's a bit of bounce coming from a wall um, just behind me. And it gave this really nice light. It gets a kick into his eyes yeah. so that the light on his eyes is nice. And then you just wait for the right expression. And I, I wanted this sort of expression with him doing something with his hand that, that gave the photograph a little bit of energy and more interest than just a straight portrait. But the important thing is the lighting. And often if it's bright sunlight, I'll just shoot against the sun, shoot into the sun. And very often you can play with exposure so that you don't need bounce. But if you can get a little bit of bounce, that's better still, because that will give a catch light in the eyes. Can we see an example of uh, shooting into the sun? An example like this of two women in uh, Myanmar smoking cheroots, and the sun illuminates the smoke. Without the backlighting, you wouldn't see the smoke. Absolutely. It would be a dead shot. But by shooting it in this direction, it, it emphasizes the smoke. You get a nice rim light on the faces. Mm -hmm. So it just works. So don't think just because it's hard, harsh sunlight, you're not going to be able to make decent portraits or Shall decent photographs, period. You know, I shoot a lot during the day and get some nice shots. It doesn't need to be said the best time, of the golden hours an hour sunset, an hour at sunrise, you know, that's when the light is, cons it's like when the light is the prettiest. Yes. Uh, and everybody knows that, or at least all you photographers out there should know should that. Should know about that. Yeah, you, know, you should know about that. So you got to get up early and get those golden hours before you, you know, go off and... Out before sunrise, have dinner after the sunset. That's right. But uh, what I really like is after the sun's gone down in the blue hour, mm. after the sun's gone, and you get this beautiful blue light, which when it's mixed with artificial light, you get effects like this. Mm -hmm. It was a barber shop in uh, Trinidad, Trinidad, Cuba. Um, it's where I'd had a disastrous haircut earlier in the day. But I just happened to be walking by in the evening and I, the blue of the walls was enhanced by the twilight and the, the inside light, the warm inside light, contrasts beautifully with the light outside. Now, I, I love this play of colors with the light. Um, you really have that feel, don't you, for what light is doing and the colors and what, what it's going to look like in the final photograph. Yeah, this is an example of why you should be aware of what your camera is capable of doing. Yeah. Because it didn't look like this to your eye. Your eyes compensate. Right. They compensate for color difference. Uh, they compensate for differences in color temperature. Cameras are literal. Your eyes adjust continually. All so that, which is one of the things you have to remember about how a camera records shadow areas. To me, I can see in the corner of the room here, which is dark, and see Holly here, and I can see details in Holly's clothing, although it's you know, dark blue and black. But a camera won't see that. Right. If, if we get the highlights recorded properly, everything else is going to go dark with no detail. And that's one of the important things you should always remember in taking photographs. You always expose for the highlights and let the shadows look after themselves. This as we did with film. Well, actually, it doesn't... Yeah, okay, cool. So, I want to thank you guys for... Are we rolling? Yeah, we're rolling. <laughs> I've been rolling Let's do it. Does that mean we're rolling? Okay, I want to thank you guys for watching and be sure to subscribe. We want you to like if you like our video, of course. You can comment down here and also please share these with other people because we want to bring Bob Holmes to as many photographers as we can. And if you would, support us with Patreon. We're funding this 
full series ourselves, so your contributions will really help us bring more great content to you guys. And Bob, you have a workshop you'd like to mention. I've been running international workshops for several years, and you can find information at Lumaria, L-U-M-A-R-I-A, workshops.com. And also, I'm a regular poster on Instagram and give regular photography tips. And my Instagram address is Bob Holmes Photo. So hopefully I'll meet you there too. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, guys.